Well, welcome to the Shrine of Remembrance vlogcast, exploring all facets of our wartime history. And this episode was supported by the Victorian government. This conversation and meeting today is on the traditional lands of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains. So I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and also acknowledge the continuing relationship that they have with the land on which we're making this VOD or video cast today. Hello, my name is Megan Spencer and um, I have a background in broadcasting and radio making and recently I made a podcast called From a Whisper to a Bang for the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. It was a six-part, one-hour series about wartime remembrance and in the podcast I interview our guest today, our guest speaker, my co-conversationalist, uh, military historian Professor Peter Monteith from Flinders University, who just happens to be sitting in front of me right now. Hi. Hi, Megan. Yes, as it so happens, we're in the, the same studio. Uh, not as if uh, it's the first time we've talked together. We've talked together before, including, as you said, in your fabulous podcast, From a Whisper to a Bang, um, and it turns out we have lots of things in common uh, because both of us have established this abiding interest in Second World War uh, and the ways in which we remember uh, the Second World War. Um, we both live in Adelaide, as it, as it turns out. Uh, we have a great interest in a particular battalion, uh, though we come at that from different angles because you have a family connection. I, I come as a historian of the Second World War. And we both lived in Berlin for a while as well, which um, occurs to me is one of those things that, that we have in common. I'd forgotten that, but yes, yeah, absolutely. So my podcast, From a Whisper to a Bang, explores what I call the little-known Anzac story that took place on Greece and Crete. And you've written a book, uh, well, you've written a couple of books actually around that, but you've written a new book that really focuses or zeroes in on a particular battle that was part of that Battle of Crete in 1941 in which my grandfather fought. He was in the 2nd, 7th Battalion. There was another Australian battalion that was part of that, the 2nd, 8th, and five New Zealand battalions, including the 28th Maori Battalion. And uh, there was a particular battle um, that we're going to explore today. Um, maybe you, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I want to hold up. This is Peter's book called Battle on 42nd Street, War in Crete and the Anzacs, Bloody Last Stand. And you and I have, we've, well, I was at your book launch last year in Adelaide at the Virtual War Memorial. So um, we're going to reprise this conversation in a little bit more detail today and I guess bring our respective perspectives <laughs> to looking at the Battle of Crete, this moment in history, this um, second incarnation of the Anzacs, if you will, and also this particular battle that took place over, um, well, within that 12-day that period of the Battle of Crete. Does that sound about right? That sounds right to me and, and we'll, we'll cover... Uh the interests we share both in that battle, that that war, um, and the remembrance of those things. And, and that's opposite today because of it, it is the anniversary today of uh, uh, the 27th of May, 1941, and, and that significant battle, as, as I think it is, uh, that took place on 42nd Street. Yeah. So before we go any further, I just want to say um, that Peter and I are both extremely grateful to the Shrine of Remembrance in Melbourne we're offering to film this conversation because we're in lockdown. <laughs> we were going to do this live, but we're filming it instead. So we want to say thank you very much to them for making this available to you, their community, to continue to engage with uh, commemoration and doing it with uh, a bit of a creative hat on, I guess you could say. That's right. Yeah. Look, in, in a way, it's a shame we were hoping to be in Melbourne right now. We're, we're not for, for circumstances that we all understand. Uh, but this is a great and creative way uh, to go about achieving something very similar. So yeah. I'm, I'm excited about it. Yeah, and we might explore that idea a little mm. bit further on uh, in our conversation today. But look, this was this was a battle that so many Australians were involved in uh, in in World War Two. But look, let's let's dig into the story now, mm. Peter. Let's dive right in. Yeah. Into the battle on 42nd Street. So on this day, 79 years ago, today, May 27, 1941, 
The battle of, on 42nd Street on the island of Crete took place between, as I mentioned, a contingent of Australia, Australian and New Zealand troops and, of course, um, a contingent or a battalion of uh, elite German troops. I believe the 1st Battalion of the 141st Alpine Regiment. Is that right? Yep, that's it. <laughs> yeah, they're the, they're the key ones on the, the, yeah. the German side. And they were freshly arrived to Crete, is that right? That, that's right. Most of them had only just arrived, um, but the war had been going on for about a week. So the, the background to it is that... Um, the Australian and New Zealand forces had fought in Greece, which was really a disastrous campaign. And some will say it probably shouldn't have taken place at all because the the chances that the combined British forces would stop the German invasion of mainland Greece were, were very poor. But for better or worse, uh, Australians and New Zealanders and others had been sent to mainland Greece. And from the moment the Germans invaded, um, those men were placed on the back foot. So, so were, there were some Australians who were way up in the north of Greece and tried to stop the Germans when they invaded from Yugoslavia and from Bulgaria, but had little hope against the German firepower. The, the Germans were very strong in the air um, and on the ground. And so quite rapidly, the Australians and New Zealanders and others, they were pushed back to the south. Uh, they barely had the opportunity to, to stand fast and, and, and try to turn that tide of battle uh, until by the end of um, April that was all over. Uh, and indeed it would have been on Anzac Day that lots of those Australians and New Zealanders found themselves in, in Royal Navy vessels uh, being transported from the evacuation beaches on the Greek mainland and towards the island of, of Crete. And Harry um, would have been one of them. My grandfather, yeah. And they were also, we should point out, they were there as part of an allied force. They were fighting alongside Greek and British troops from other dominions as well, uh, Commonwealth dominions. Yeah, so there were a lot of people on that island. There are, <laughs> on, on, well, on Greece initially, uh, I should say, the mainland. On Greece initially, yes, yeah, yes, and, and, yeah. But including this, uh, this Anzac call, because I think a lot of people, when they think Anzac, they think First World War. And, and we're interesting in Australia in, in that respect that we, we tend to think of the First World War before we think of the, the Second World War. That's the one that, that dominates the national memory, I, I think it's true to say. Um, but there was this um, Anzac Corps, which was formed again um, in this vain attempt to, uh, attempt in vain to, to stop uh, the German invasion of, of Greece. Yeah. You've been very diplomatic around that <laughs> because, look, Part of, um, I guess part of what I wanted to do with making my Remembrance podcast was actually fly the flag for this second official formation of uh, this Anzac Corps because I, I feel that um, that it's been buried under the sort of nation-building mythology of the, mm. of the first one in Gallipoli, not taking anything away from that at all. But also there's been other formations of Anzac Corps um, subsequently to World War II and I just think... This is such an extraordinary story. I get when you were talking just now. I got the goosebumps yeah. again. I always do because, and we, we will. You'll, you'll find out why as we continue this yeah. this chat. But um, it has been a bit overlooked, hasn't it? This second ANZAC formation. I, I think so. I, I think that's true. Um, despite the fact that it, the, the campaign on the main, the mainland and in Crete is really fascinating from a military historical viewpoint. We're probably a little bit different from the New Zealanders because in New Zealand memory, there's a much greater awareness of the Second World War because, of course, a lot of those New Zealanders stayed on beyond uh, the battle for Crete and um, fought on in Europe. They were there in the Western Desert. They were there in Italy. And so I think in New Zealand national memory, there's a greater presence of the Second World War and, and the war in Europe, whereas for us, when we think about the Second World War, it's probably more about the war in the Pacific and insofar as we think of, uh, of Europe, it, it's maybe the Australian um, participation in um, the, the war in the air, but, but not these campaigns on the ground and especially mm. not in, in Greece and, and Crete. That was so hard fought. So we'll pick up where you paused. Mm. Um, there was a mass evacuation of troops from Greece some went to Egypt and some went to Crete. Maybe you can pick that up from there. Yeah. 
Because as it happens, it was on Anzac Day, 25th of April, that Hitler decided that um, having um, claimed the mainland of Greece, he would invade the island of Crete as well because he thought that um, in terms of strategic importance, it was worth taking that extra step. It would be an important um, linking point to North Africa, where, of course, uh, Rommel uh, was leading the, the Africa Corps, and it would strategically too be useful because it would protect his southern flank because at this time, um, April, May, uh, his preparations are well underway for Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union. That would happen in, in June. So he decided that um, Crete was worth invading, and so he assembled an invasion force and the striking thing about it is that he imagines, he and others imagine, that they can take Crete from the air. And that's really the distinctive thing about this, this battle. Um, and from the perspective of the defenders, the, the force that was assembled um, in Crete, uh, led by uh, a New Zealander, Bernard Freiburg, their job was to prepare for this invasion, but they at least had the advantage of knowing that in large part this was going to be an airborne invasion. So that was the challenge for them. They, they knew that the Germans were coming. They had a pretty good idea when it would be. They had quite large numbers of troops, but in very large part they were troops who'd been on the mainland and they knew what they were up against in terms and of they were this. exhausted, right? And they were exhausted. <laughs> yeah. And half of them who'd come over, the, the the ship on which they were coming over on the SS Costa Rica was bombed and s started to sink and they had to be evacuated and yeah. then taken over with yeah. like losing their boots, their rifles. And when yeah. they got there, yeah. they didn't really have much to work with, did yeah, they? Yeah, so even the evacuation was traumatic uh, for many. And, of course, there were some left behind. There, there were some mm. who didn't make it to the evacuation beaches in, in Greece and they became... POWs. Um, others were luckier. They managed to get on board the, these boats. Um, they were taken to, to Crete um, and then were told that they had to prepare for the Germans all over again. Mm. And they didn't have any air cover or much to speak of and they really were under-equipped in every respect, weren't they, when they got to Crete? That, that's right. I think the striking thing for them was the air power of the Germans and the, the, the failure of the Allies to, to counter that air presence of, of the Germans. And I think it's really important to, to in terms of setting the sort of psychological context, to be aware of that, that um, these men over a long period were subjected to this dominance of the Luftwaffe in, in the air. And um, they, they use this expression, the RAF, that, that never seemed to be there to, to take on the Luftwaffe, the, the Australians said that RAF meant rare as fairies or, or <laughs> rare as something else um, <laughs> because they were, it seemed to them, continuously mm. exposed to, to this threat from the air. Yeah. And look, um, there's one other, I suppose, bone of contention too. Um, it was always going to be an airborne invasion, but there was some confusion around that, wasn't there, um, where one of the generals on Crete thought that it was the the, the uh, attack would come from the sea. That's right. Freiburg himself, he he uh, prepared for both <coughs> sorts of invasion, seaborne and, and airborne, uh, and he's been much criticised for that because it's been said if only he'd disposed his forces in such a way to protect the airfields, um, then he might have managed to save Crete. In his defence, the intelligence he had was suggesting that there would be a seaborne component, um, but arguably he placed too much emphasis on that. There was a seaborne component, but it was relatively small, and as it happened, it was intercepted by the Royal Navy anyway, so that seaborne invasion never happened. Um, everything hinged on whether the Germans could claim at least one of the airfields on Crete. And it did. And they got one and it was on. Yeah. That that was it. So that was mm. really the turning point. That very first day, what the Germans needed to do was take at least one of the three airfields. They focused their air attacks on all three. Uh, they landed thousands um, in the vicinity of those airfields. 
And at the end of the first day, it was not at all clear whether they would succeed in in taking just one. But in the end, at, at the end of that crucial first day, they managed to shift the New Zealand defenders away from the Malamay airfield. This was the one uh, at the western end of the island. And arguably at that point, the outcome of the battle, even if it went on for for, um, many more days, uh, arguably at that point, once they had their foothold on the island, arguably the outcome of the entire battle for Crete was, was decided because what it meant then was that they could... Uh, with possession of just one airfield, fly in as many mountain troops as they wanted to so that they would accumulate such a force so well armed that no matter how courageous the resistance, ultimately force of numbers would mean that the Germans would win. Yeah, and they were very well armed and the ground forces fighting them were not so well armed. They were scrabbling around trying to get anything really weren't they to hold them off at some points yeah that, that's right even things like radio equipment they they were poorly supplied with radio equipment um, artillery tanks uh, all the sorts of things that would have been really useful in resisting the invasion they didn't have in the number and in the quality mm. that they would have needed at that crucial time yeah and we should possibly also point out, because in your book you give all sorts of perspectives from all sorts from the various players in this or the different sides, and um, there were thousands of paratroopers flying down, and they were, a lot of them were shot in the air. They died terrible deaths. These young German soldiers. I also found out recently. I'm going to plug this because it's such a good book. Cree Force, the Anzacs, and the Battle of Crete. In case you're interested, um, this is a new, uh, a reissued book by Stella Tsopanakis. I found out from reading this that the average age, she says, of the paratroopers was something like between 17 and 19 years old, these young German kids flying down to their deaths. I mean, also fighting. They were well-trained, super well-trained soldiers who, you know, weren't weren't afraid of um, shooting and doing all that dreadful stuff that happens in war. But um, that I also found very, very moving, actually, finding that out. That's right, and that's what I tried to do in... in in the book is to look at it from different perspectives because of of course there's an Australian perspective, there's a New Zealand perspective, but there is the German perspective and there's a British perspective because there were British um, forces there as well. And of course there's the the local perspective, the the Cretan perspective. The resistance. The resistance there because Mm. it wasn't just the um, the, the British forces who were given that task, the, the local population too, they were defending their island and they weren't well armed. Um, so in many cases, they used whatever they could get hold of to try to resist this invasion because they, they were a people who had a long history of living under occupation, experiencing invasion. And so not surprisingly, they worked together with the um, the British forces, the Australians, the New Zealanders, and um, did whatever they could to, to turn the, the tide of battle. Yeah, during battle and also after, it was uh, all over too. They, the, they hid very, quite a few, they hit hundreds or thousands of, yeah. of uh, uh, um, allied troops who uh, chose not to surrender. That's right. Mm. I think that's important for the, the context of it, that if you think... If you think about what had happened in the war to that point, the, the Germans had won rapid victories, really, in, in Eastern Europe, in Poland, and then um, uh, Denmark, and, and up in Norway, and then the Low Countries, France. And then there's this battle which they probably expect to win uh, relatively easily. They didn't have a good idea about how many people were there. So they expected that this would be relatively straightforward, only to find that the island was bitterly um, contested by the locals and and the other uh, forces who for a while had been well camouflaged. They they didn't know um, how um, well disposed they had been to protect the airfields. Um, So the Germans, from their point of view, they got a massive shock on that day when they sought to take Crete. Well, let's, yeah sort of hubris, wasn't it, or arrogance mm. or just sorely underestimated their opponents. Let's hop, skip and jump a little bit further in now. I think, I mean, your book 
meticulously sets this up. Mm. And it's also it also talks about the weapon of choice in uh, battle on 42nd Street, this particular battle that yeah. took place 79 years ago today on the 27th of May, 41. There was a bayonet involved, and I think your very first chapter goes mm. into a bit of a, the context and yeah. the history of the bayonet. So speaking of people getting surprises, <laughs> um, the battle on 42nd Street kind of took everyone by surprise from what I can gather reading your book. Is that, is that a fair thing to say? I think that's that's fair. It surprised the the Germans, and in a way, it was a surprise for the defenders. And I I do talk about the bayonet quite a bit. Um, not that a lot of killing in the Second World War generally was done with bayonets, and you'd say the same about the First World War. But there was this recognition that the bayonet was still an important weapon, largely because of its psychological value. Oh. That um, when men. <laughs> oh. um, fixed their bayonets, they, they knew that the situation was, was serious and they had been conditioned through their training that at that moment when their commanding officers told them to fix bayonets, this, this was a serious situation and, and they had to become aggressive. So I think what happens is they're, they're trained to, to switch into a kind of aggressive state. And the interesting thing about 42nd Street is that they're given the opportunity almost unexpectedly to let that training um, play out because until then we were talking about mainland uh, Greece the war there had been fought largely at a distance so most of the killing was from a distance it was from the skies or it was artillery or maybe machine guns and a good part of um, the battle on Crete too was the same but on this occasion there's close combat almost intimate you would say because what happens on this particular morning is that German forces advance through olive trees. They don't really know what's ahead of them. They have a sense that the the enemy must be there somewhere, but they don't know exactly where. They they have the sense, having just arrived on the island, that the, the Allies are falling back in disarray, that uh, the tide of battle is well and truly in their favour. But then, to their astonishment, they encounter a defensive force that doesn't just um, block their advance, but for the first time, really, after all of that experience in Greece and the first week of the battle in Crete, um, actually fights back and fights back um, almost savagely, you would say. Yeah, so they were kind of on the back foot and then this strange moment happened where they were on the front foot and they attacked, the, the Allies attacked, the Anzacs. And, and now are we, are we allowed to call them Anzacs on, on Crete? Well, I, I have to say that, that that's okay, I think, because that's in the subtitle of my book. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> but technically that Anzac, that corps had been formed on the, the mainland and then there was a different command structure on, on Crete. Um, but there were Australians and New Zealanders fighting side by side. And, and that was quite literally the case on, on 42nd Street because it was Australians and New Zealanders. And they um, would have considered themselves Anzacs, of course, still. Yeah. That cont continuity would have been there. Would, would have been right. very aware of yeah. that of that tradition in, in which they stood. And, and those circumstances at that particular time brought them together in very close proximity. They had, to some extent, been disposed to different parts of the island. But during this particular stage of the battle, it was those Australian battalions you mentioned, including Harry's uh, 2nd, 7th, and then the 2nd, 8th, that other Victorian battalion, that were alongside uh, a number of New Zealand battalions. So that would have, if anything, strengthened that that awareness of an Anzac tradition. Now let me th see if I can, I've, I've snuck it down here. I want to mm. say that out loud because there'll be New Zealand people watching this who will have a stake in this too. So I think it was the the 19th, 21st, 22nd, 23rd and the 28th Māori Battalion 5 mm. from New Zealand. So so where were they? Where like what what is 42nd Street and mm. and where is it on the island? So we we we're, we're in day around day 7 after the Battle yeah. of Crete started. Yeah, 42nd Street is near Suda Bay, the, the main harbour uh, with port facilities, which is just near the capital of Hanya. Uh, 
and it was a sunken dirt road, so fairly primitive, that ran from the the tip of Suda Bay or near the tip of Suda Bay uh, down towards, uh, in a southerly direction roughly, um, towards the foothills. And it was named 42nd yep, yep. Street by a company of uh, British um, engineers who'd been there in the previous year. Um, it was the 42nd Field Company, so they, they named it after themselves and would have been aware of the the musical and, and everything. And and though those um, engineers had left by then, the, the name had stuck. Uh, there's quite a nice illustration of the, the, the street sign that was um, uh, displayed there. And it became important because the Anzacs were falling back towards the east because of the build-up of German forces in the west from Malame and then in the territory um, stretching from Malame, the, the airfield. And it was useful as a defensive line because along one side of the road um, the, the, the dirt was heaped up so that it offered some cover to them. And when they fell back there in the night from the 26th of May, uh, they took shelter there along the road and in the olive groves around the road. Uh, a lot of them thinking that there were still Allied forces further to the west who would protect them. So they didn't realise at first that actually this was now going to be it. the... Yeah. They were it. Yeah. Uh, and, and all would depend on them. And when they became aware of that, they assembled along that defensive line, knowing that at some point, they couldn't know when, but at some point um, the German forces would arrive. So was that kind of the unwitting start of the formation of this rear guard where there were a line of Anzac and Allied troops holding off the Germans while the rest of the troops, because everyone knew the jig was up, it was over, where yeah. the rest of the troops were making their way south to be eventually yeah. evacuated a few days later? Would you say? It, or it, I, I would, yeah, that's right. Certainly um, at that part of the island it was becoming clear that um, the, the German force there was overwhelming and they were going to have to withdraw. And for those who were fighting around that uh, area of, of Crete, the, what would happen would be that they would be told to cross over the, the spine of the island and, and go to a, an evacuation mm. point on the south coast. Mm. There was fighting on other parts of the island, um, at the other end at Heraklion, and uh, when it became obvious there that um, the game was up, then they would be evacuated from Wouldn't Heraklion. They? Yep. Yep. Um, but yeah, that that's right. So at, at this point, the best that can be hoped for um, is to stage the same kind of evacuation that had worked pretty well actually from the mainland. The mainland. Yeah. All over again, Groundhog Day. Yeah, or it's a bit like Gallipoli all over again as well, you know, because it's often said of Gallipoli that really the evacuation was the, the most successful part of, mm. of that campaign. And so that that's what they were confronted with by, by this time. All right. Let's get into what happened yeah. on the battle on 42nd Street. Yeah. Over to you. <laughs> the stage has been set. Mm. Yeah. Well, there, there was this defensive line and, and there are some competing stories. And what I try to do in the book is tell the story from different viewpoints. And the stories aren't necessarily exactly the same in every point. There's some dispute, I think, about whether this advanced party of German mountain troops first made contact with uh, an Australian battalion or a New Zealand battalion. The the New Zealanders or the Maoris will <laughs> they'll claim it. They would like to claim it for themselves. Yes. And, and, and it's not at all clear and it's not clear mm. at exactly what time this happened. But clearly after that first contact with the defensive line, quite quickly the defensive forces organised themselves and they had spoken about this possibility beforehand and, and they had agreed amongst themselves, the New Zealanders and Australians, that if the Germans arrived, then they would charge. And so many had already fixed their bayonets. And um, so when that first contact happened, all hell broke loose, I think is the best way to describe it. And the Australians and New Zealanders very quickly um, went on to the offensive and they 
led with their bayonets, which is not to say they only killed with bayonets. 18-inch bayonets. Very long you, bayonets. From World War One. Yeah, the yeah. same ones as yeah. they were using essentially as in, in the First World War. And they charged these unsuspecting Germans who it seems didn't really know what had hit them and pushed them back very rapidly, but in doing so killed significant numbers of them. And what I try to do in, in the book is is enter into the mindset of, of these men and um, try to explain this, this um, aggressive state um, and the, the term bloodlust might be used, I, I suppose, um, and which would help to account for uh, how it was that they charged with such passion but also with such a, uh, a sense of shared purpose. Um, so it, it was that emotion that that led them in this charge and was clearly shared by New Zealanders and Australians alike. When I first read about this battle and, and then subsequently your book that goes into much more detail into it, I feel almost guilty saying it because I'm so anti-war. I truly, truly, truly am. I find it abhorrent. But I was thrilled. <laughs> It's a thrilling tale. Mm. It is the whole Battle of Crete is, I think, partly because there's such desperation involved, and things happen in it that you just can't. A beggar's belief, and you can't believe people actually kind of continue. You know, they literally sol soldier mm. on. So there was an element of, oh my God, it's like this is incredibly thrilling, and incredibly sad and awful. And hideous and hell-like and, yeah. and made me sick too mm. kind of thing. Like you had these competing emotions. Um, it wouldn't be the first or last battle anyone might encounter and read about and not and, and have that. But yeah. maybe because my grandfather was also part of it, I <clears throat> that you know, there's a there's a visceral sort of connection yeah. there as well. Yeah. But I f what I find really interesting, Peter, is that your continued um investigation into what makes men kill mm. in war, not just going off to die in war, as you say, but to go off and be expected to kill in, in service mm. of their country. Yeah. So I'm wondering how how do you meet those conflicting kind of yeah. ideas or emotions, yeah, when you're writing or researching? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's important not to avoid that issue, I, I think what, not to avoid it. Not to yeah. avoid it, because yeah. uh, I, I think the the temptation might be to to think of war in terms of um, the experience of death and suffering, and to tell stories in which Australians or whoever it might be go away to die. Um, but of course, part of being a soldier, part of the the logic of war is is to kill, and so these men had to deal with uh, a fear of dying, uh, but I think they also had to, to deal with a fear of killing. Uh, mm. I think a lot of them wouldn't have known what that might be like. Uh, I don't think one can assume by any means that, that a man put into a position on a battlefield would necessarily undertake that task. And, and indeed, there were lots of studies of soldiers in the Second World War that concluded that most of them wouldn't kill. Um, so I think it's important too because um, if what we want to do is, is empathise to understand what it's like to be a soldier and to understand what we expect of men we, we send into battle, um, we have to understand that that's part of what they went through, that's part of what they had to deal with uh, and it's part of who they are after they return from war if, if they're fortunate enough to return mm. from war. So. I think it's important um, to, to bear that reality of, of war in mind. Mm. It, it, it's part of what war is. It's, it's, it's a central part yeah. of what war is. And I think if we're going to have any go any ways to prevent it, we need to know that mm. on that level. May I invite you to read a passage to talk to that even in a bit more oh, okay. uh, detail from your book, if you'd like to. Um, one of the soldiers in the second seventh, one of the Australian soldiers, was a gentleman by the name of Reginald Saunders, who is one of Australia's most famous soldiers. Uh, he's a Gunditjmara man from southeastern Victoria in Australia, and sorry, southwestern. Beg your pardon. And um, 
he uh, also went on to become one, um, the first known uh, commissioned Aboriginal officer, First Nations officer in the Australian Army at that time. He he made it off Crete eventually after being stuck there for 11 months hiding from the uh, German invaders, hid, hidden by a Cretan family, went back to Australia, retrained, goes to New Guinea, fights another war, becomes uh, a captain eventually, and then 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 goes to Korea, Korea the Korean yeah. War. He's got an incredible, um, he's a Korea soldier, actually. Mm. But um, you use some of his words to talk about that moment um, yeah. of, of realising that you ha- it's kill or be killed. Yeah, yeah. And it was in the battle on 42nd Street. Yeah. So Reg Saunders fought in that battle. Yeah, yeah, so I could read some of his words here as I've um, um, mm. used them in the book. Um, maybe a, a couple of bits. So there's one where he, he talks about this occasion on which, um, if, as far as he knows, he first killed uh, someone. I deliberately shot him, you know. I lined him up and I knew I could kill him because I was a very good rifle shot. He was the first one that I'd ever seen in a position where I could kill him and I killed him. When I got there, I was terribly sorry about it. I looked at him and he was a blonde, blue-eyed bloke because his eyes were open. Blood was still running out of him, out of his mouth because I shot him. He was down and I shot him uh, through the, went into his back. Probably went the full length of his body, you know. Awful experience. And I rolled him over to have a look at him and I thought, Jesus, you're about the same age as me. I wish I could say, come on, old fellow, get up and let's get on with the bloody game, you know, thinking football. And then there are some other words from Reg Saunders again that um, addresses that that crucial part of the, this particular battle, and that is the, the bayonet charge. Uh, and he he said, when Jerry saw us coming and someone gave a yell to give himself more courage, everyone took it up. Before you could say it, we were bolting along, screeching at the tops of our voices. It was crazy, crazy, the most thrilling few minutes of my life. We were all obsessed with this mad race to slaughter with the bayonet. It wasn't like killing kangaroos and more. When we got close, they were real men, excited like us and some of them terribly frightened. They were highly trained Germans, but they got such a shock at our din and the way we ran that they forgot they were supermen and ran the whole 400 of them. We used knees and rifle butts and our blades. For a while we stopped being ordinary blokes and became bloodlusted creatures. Mm. There are uh, three hours worth of Reginald Saunders' voice recorded on the Australian War Memorial website. I've listened to it twice. Um, one of the episodes I made, made in the podcast, uh, episode five, Defending Country, includes some of his voice and goes into more detail around um, remembrance of Indigenous service. And um, I interviewed his daughter, Auntie Glenda Humes. And But uh, I tell you what, listening to, to, to Reginald Saunders talk about war is uh, gives you a great, great insight, as you would well know, having included those words in... Your book, you get right down to the, to the nitty gritty, don't you? Mm. Listening to words like that, listening to his words taught me a lot about war. And when I was listening to his words and listening to him speak, I thought, God, he, I bet uh, he, he reminded me of my grandfather. It's same sort of era, but also mm. just when you become a soldier, the world changes and you see mm. it in a particular way, you yeah. know, yeah. including combat and how do you deal with that afterwards mm. and all that sort of stuff that goes with it. But um, phenomenal soldier, actually. Mm. But it's really wonderful that you include his words in that and the other uh, quotes from various people in there to give that almost Rashomon-like perspective on on this this one moment of of this particular yeah. this particular battle. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's like I I take this particular battle to to stand for war more more broadly yeah. and and to try to understand it from different points of views and let the words of the participants speak for themselves and then readers can make up their own minds in large part what what they think about that. Mm. So what was the upshot of this phenomenal battle that saw these Mm. elite young mountain troops running for the hills, screaming apparently, according to some of the witness statements there, there was apparently a haka, a war cry from a traditional war cry from the Maori some of the Maori soldiers, and and during during it, not just one at the start, but mm. during it, if we're to believe that as well, um, yeah. What was the upshot of it all at the end of this? Is it ten to twelve minutes it lasted for? 
Well, it's very difficult to know because the, the Australians and New Zealanders claim, of course, that they push them back great distances. And there's some variation in the estimate of uh, how far they push them back. And indeed, that was the, one of the, the problems that was associated with this um, uh, transfer into this uh, aggressive state that the, the commanding officers, to some extent, lost control over them <laughs> and eventually had to to call them back and some claim that they pushed them back a mile or even a mile. But the upshot of it was that um, something over 120 Germans were killed and, and were, were dead on the, the battlefield. The Australians and New Zealanders were, were called back. Um, but ultimately, uh, although they had won some time for, for people who were now going to um, head towards evacuation beaches, ultimately that line couldn't be held, uh, so they had to vacate it later in the day, and that gave the Germans the chance to inspect the, the battlefield that, that day and then again more thoroughly the next day. And as that happened, the... Australian, New Zealand and other uh, Allied troops, they trudged across the island as fast as they could in very difficult circumstances um, towards the, the fishing village of Svakia on, on the south coast because um, that was their one chance for escape. And in, in doing that, in large part, the men who'd fought the battle on 42nd Street, um, including the 2nd 7th, had this task of holding up the advance of uh, the Germans as best they could so that as many men as possible could get off the island. The 2nd 7th um, did that extremely well um, until they themselves arrived at Svakia, only to find that that battalion wasn't able to um, get onto an, an evacuation vessel. So that, um, sadly, most of those men, including Harry, who fought so gallantly, uh, was stuck on the island yeah, and became, in, in many cases, became POWs. So are you drawing a line from this battle to that moment? Like, if it hadn't happened, do you think maybe they might have gotten off, off the island, perhaps? That's very difficult. Difficult to say. Um, I, I think it most realistically in, in terms of the outcome of the battle, um, perhaps it delayed the German advance. I, I think probably much of its significance is is um, as much symbolic mm. as military uh, because what it demonstrated was that in the right conditions and for the Anzacs, I think the most favourable conditions were those conditions of close combat. Mm. Um, in the right conditions, they showed that the Germans could be defeated, that they weren't invincible, that the fortune of war could be reversed. And I point out that it was on this day, as it happens, that the Bismarck was sunk. So even before Operation Barbarossa, there were these first signs that um, the Germans could be defeated. And this battle was, was one of those signs that um, uh, fortunes could be reversed. Such a shame it wasn't recognised, I guess, really, back then. I mean, look, for so many more reasons than we probably got time yeah. to go into today, but yeah. uh, gee whiz. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, fortunately, there is a memorial there now and uh, people who travel to Crete, and it's such a beautiful island, it's worth visiting for any number of reasons. But uh, for those who are interested in, in, in the history of the Second World War, uh, it's it's worth visiting the memorial on 42nd Street as it's worth making a... You can make a, a kind of pilgrimage, I suppose, to Svakia. Um, you can go to the, the Commonwealth War Cemetery. It's a beautiful cemetery not far from 42nd Street at, at the, the tip of um, Suda Bay. Uh, the German cemetery near Malame too is very worth visiting. Um, so these are, are great sites of remembrance. I'd recommend that to, to anyone. Mm. Well, it's uh, maybe it lasted 10 or 12 minutes, but it's a huge story that um, travels across, you know, eight decades now um, for you to tell in, in your book. And just as it relates back to my grandfather's story and what I explore in the podcast, what ends up happening is that 
thousands of troops, Allied troops, are left on the island after the navy, like bravely, valiantly evacuated. I think was it sixteen thousand or something yeah, like from, that. Yeah, from both Fakia and and and, mm. and a great loss of mm. life to um, uh, sailors of of the Royal Navy. Mm. Um, they lost ships and men in their efforts to to evacuate as mm. many men as they possibly could. So there was, I think, around just over 3,100 Australian troops who couldn't get on those evacuation ships and were left there. There were just over 2,000 New Zealand troops and I think another 6,000 combined allied, allied troops left on that island. And there was a surrender officially on the 1st of June. Is that correct? Yep. yep. And uh, they were given... This, some of the Australian troops were given the option to either surrender and become prisoners of war or to take their chances in inverted commas and head for the hills and hide out until a hopeful uh, e- evacuation or escape pickup from mm. allied submarines and, and um, a whole bunch of different sort mm. of means and methods um, at some point in, in the future. So yeah. total uncertainty on with, with both options, I guess. Yeah. That's right, yeah, and and as you said before, um, Reg Saunders was one of the the luckier ones who who managed to get off the island um, quite some time later. Others were less fortunate, and most of them fell into German hands, and so began the the biggest part of their war, and that was the the, the time they spent in in captivity. Mm. And Harry spent four years in captivity in four different German prison camps. From that moment, yeah. from that moment, imagine, like I just. Imagine all that effort and fighting and, and that little mini success of repelling the Germans. Mm. And I know it's under horrendous, atrocious, brutal, bloody circumstances, but imagine having that win and then getting to the beach and that and then and and then it's all over and then the whole power shifts again and you're you've got your job taken off you. You've got mm. potentially you don't know what's gonna happen if you're gonna live or die. Yeah. And you're a prisoner. You have no liberty left anymore and that's it. Like yeah. And I, I think, I think personally, this is like an Australian version of Dunkirk, and I want mm. to see this made into the big budget um, the, because it, it also brings so many different cultures together. You mm. know, the, the ensconced on on Crete, there are great relationships between Greece and Crete, yep. and the Australians and New Zealanders and the English too because of this particular battle. And I think it's yeah. so worth. Yeah, that out. yeah, you no, it, it foreshadows a, a good part of Australian history after the war as well because of that special relationship, and that mm. develops, of course, further in mm. into the the post war period. Mm. Look, you and I could keep talking about this battle forever, but I guess we probably need to start winding this conversation up. I think great history and great storytelling, and when they combine, well, history is storytelling, but it's taking that empathetic point of view, that's what I maintain and it's mm. what I attempted to do yeah. in my podcast from all different points of view and listening to others and the voices of others. And I think you also do yeah. that in this book too, Peter. Yeah, look, I started um, listening a second time to the podcast series From a Whisper to a Bang and there's so much in there. Um, it's about Greece and Crete, but it's about so much more. It's about wartime Germany. It's about the 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 POW experience, which is such a big part of, of Harry's war. Um, but it's also about remembrance, memory, um, and how important that is mm. to us and, and how we can do it well. Mm. Um, so there's a lot there that will appeal, I think, to everyone. So on this day, the 27th of May 2020, we're in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've... The, the Melbourne Shrine of Remembrance uh, has kindly offered to film us have this chat rather than us sitting on the stage in there physically with uh, a, a live audience. So I guess we've had to, everyone's had to be creative and bring that to the party about how we, we do this. I mean, it's not too complicated. We're just filming our conversation. But I wonder, Peter, um, you know, especially also with Anzac Day at mm. home, you know, or down the end of your driveway at dawn, lighting a candle. Um, what ideas you might have around this challenge or this particular moment in time where we're having to look at doing remembrance yeah. differently? Do you have yeah. any ideas around that as an historian? Yeah. It, it, well, it reminds me as an historian that we've done remembrance in 
different ways over time. I, I think there's a temptation to think that um, Anzac Day was always as we know it, but of course it wasn't always thus, and um, memory too has a history. Uh, and if we look back, the I think the very first acts of remembrance were acts driven largely by the need to mourn the dead, and often that labour of mourning was undertaken by individuals and their families, so it was at that sort of micro level, and then over time it was the task of civil society, it was larger groups, it was collective, and then uh, over time too uh, the, the state stepped in and, and uh, memorialisation could be in some contexts very heavily steered by the state. So these things change over time, they ebb and flow, and uh, maybe it's not so ba- such a bad thing that at the moment we, we go back to a form of remembrance which is perhaps a bit more like what it was originally, where it's driven by individuals who have the time and the space to reflect on other individuals, on family and friends. Um, that perhaps is not such an awful thing. Uh, certainly for lots of people, the collective element of it is 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 so important, um, and, and I'm sure we'll return to that. But maybe we should make the most out of what we're stuck with for now, and it, it's not all bad. That's fantastic. <laughs> that was so eloquently put. Yeah, to make it personal again, mm. I guess, is what you're saying, and, and to really um, explore and reflect on what that means. Yeah. I did the Anzac Day at dawn this year, down the end of the driveway, um, lighting a candle, and I watched my neighbour walk out and do the same, and she was so surprised to see somebody standing in her driveway next to her, and she was very, very moved by it. So yeah. it was a very interesting experience, yeah. I have to say. Yeah. And and I, you do, in the dark, <laughs> stand there and reflect when you don't, you know, you're not surrounded by a whole lot of other people. You kind of take mm. it in in a different way. Mm. Yeah. Well, look... Um, it's been amazing, I have to say, another amazing conversation with you. So I'm, I'm, I want to thank you for your time and, and for this chat. It's been illuminating. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks to you, Megan, and thanks to the Shrine of Remembrance. Mm. I'm, I'm glad that something came out of this after all, and, and um, I hope others like it as well. But for me, it's been a great experience mm. to, to reflect with you on, mm. on these issues all yeah. over again. Thank you very much. And... Um, yeah, back at you. And uh, if you're interested in seeing um, what else this shrine has online, other offerings, they have a, a page on the website shrine.org.au, uh, vog- videos and podcasts. Just go to that page and you can find out what other ways there are to commemorate in a in a different way. Just before we sign off, where can people buy your book or find your book, Peter? Um, hopefully at any good website. <laughs> Um, but through, it's published by New South Books in, in Sydney. So um, if you went to the, the New South Books website, you'd be able to get it there. Or I think through um, the, the major booksellers, you'd be fine to get a copy of it. Battle on 42nd I'm gonna Street. I'm going to hold it up because I know you're too shy to. <laughs> That's the book right there. Fantastic. Thoroughly recommend a read of it. And I'm going to also, or you can hold this up. I'll, hold I'll up get yours. you. Then, yeah. then we won't feel this, so bad. Um, fabulous series <laughs> from a whisper to a bang. Um, you can download it, I think, through lots of um, uh, possible websites, uh, lots of possible podcast supplies, if yes. that's the right word. Yeah. And and on the Australian War Memorial, the Australian War Memorial website as well. But yeah, it's on iTunes and things like that. So you know what? Like fingers crossed, maybe there's another opportunity down the track to make another episode on Crete. I think that would be interesting. Maybe we can meet there. Yeah. And have a jamboree on another <laughs> anniversary, but. Um, Thank you very much for listening to you, the Shrine of Remembrance community. I hope you've um, gotten some benefit out of listening to this conversation and um, I hope to speak to you again sometime, Peter. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Bye, everyone. Bye.